It's now time for the Weekly with New 6 Morning Anchor, Justin Warmith. This is the Weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmith. Good morning, I'm Justin Warmith. After hosting a very candid and powerful conversation about race and inequality last month, New 6 vowed to continue the conversation. And on Thursday night, we made it happen, with the focus shifting to reforming our criminal justice system. Anchor Ginger Gadsden, along with our four panelists, dove into topics like mass incarceration and issues with rehabilitation. This morning, in case you missed it, some highlights from the latest edition of Real Talk, A Candid Conversation. There are so many stats out there, and the one that I found so interesting is that the United States, this country, makes up 5% of the world's population, yet we incarcerate, of people incarcerated, we make up 25% of the people who are incarcerated. So it seems like we spend billions upon billions of dollars putting people in prisons, in jails, as opposed to maybe rehabilitating them. Do you find that we have a, you know, we are in love with incarceration? I feel like there's an issue with that. <laughs> yeah, what I find is that it's not necessarily that American, uh, uh, the American citizens are in love with incarceration. It seems like our elected officials are in love with the rhetoric uh, about tough on crime and, and policies that create uh, mass incarceration to the levels that we're seeing. Because at the end of the day, you know, when you talk about the average American citizen, where would you rather spend your money? You know, we're looking at uh, situations in which, for instance, in Florida, uh, they spend about $20,000 of taxpayers' dollars to incarcerate one individual, but yet, they're allocating less than $5,000 to educate your child, right? And I am willing to, to bet that the average taxpaying citizen will much rather their hard-earned tax dollars go towards educating their children and making sure they're getting quality education, making sure that they're getting quality head, uh, health care, making sure that their parks and roads are, are, are serviceable rather than incarcerating someone with a drug habit or incarcerating someone because they're homeless, right? We see that uh, studies have shown that a homeless person uh, may commit, say, 70 crimes a year. And if the homeless person have a substance abuse issue, the, uh, the number of crimes may skyrocket to over 90, right? You don't solve the problem of crime and you don't solve the problem of homelessness by locking people up. But that's what our country does. We lock up people who are homeless. We lock up people who have um, mental health issues. And we use our jails as hospitals, right? Once we can shift our thinking and, and look more towards healing people and, and being uh, sensitive to their needs, then we're going to engage in practices that we'll see that we'll make a smaller investment in healing people Right, and make a large investment in educating and growing our, our, our kids and growing our economy instead of growing the prison industrial complex. Sure, I, I do want to give uh, Aramis Ayala and, and Mark Romero and Agnes Gomelian a chance to answer that same question. Do you feel, uh, Ms. Ayala, there is a, you know, we're infatuated with incarceration in this country? You know, I think that we have to understand the roots of this country and we can talk about all of the responses for till we, till we turn blue. The bottom line is that this dynamic of race, this dynamic of law enforcement dates back to slave patrols, went into lynching, and now we're dealing with the concept of mass incarceration, where we have literally ballooned our incarceration um, for in, in this country. We have made more things crimes. We have uh, increased our penalties. We have made more minimum mandatories. We have changed the entire system, and then we justify our treatment of those people in the system by indicating that they are less than human. They are less than deserving. We continue to punish people even after their release because we have lost sight of that they are still Americans. They are still citizens. They still are human beings who need to re-enter properly. And so part of it is we can talk all day, like I said, about the micro changes, but we have got to talk about the macro, which deals with the humanity of other people who are committing these crimes and how we have to find common ground. And the only common ground is our humanity. Uh, Ms. Gomelian, I see you and Ed, all the panelists shaking their head at the affirmative with that. Would you like to chime in on this one? I would like to chime in. I think the macro here, I love that word. I think we need to um, obviously talk all day long about 
changing the laws, reforming the laws. Um, we need to look at uh, no-knock warrants. We need to look at um, better oversight. But I think as people, as humans, we need to look at our hearts. We need to look at each other. And we need to find, we need to find ourselves in each other. And, and when I say that, the word that comes to my mind and the word that I want to put out there and I want people to research and think about is empathy. Mm. Empathy. Empathy is, is not just feeling for your fellow Americans, it's feeling with them. It's connecting to their pain, the pain of black America, and connecting that pain to experiences that you've had, even though you've not been directly in their shoes, you can find ways to connect with them. For example, black um, people as minorities can feel powerless in the, in the political system. And, uh, and you could say, I, I've felt powerless before. In middle school, when I was bullied, you know, I felt powerless and it hurt. Or, or you trusted, uh, African-American man, you trusted that police officer to protect you and instead they hurt you and you felt betrayed. I felt betrayed before. My father, he was supposed to love my family, left my family. We can find ways, if we can find ways to see each other and more importantly, see ourselves in each other, I think that's the macro that we need to be pushing all of American culture towards. Um, and when we push American culture because of that, idea of discretion that I, I, I brought up, because discretion is such a central part of the law, when we push American culture, we're pushing criminal law. Mr. O'Mara, can you answer that question? Why do we seem to have an incarceration problem in this country? Well, part of it, Ms. Ayala touched on in one of her answers, and we have to remember that this is not just a criminal justice system problem. The criminal justice system is sort of the canary in the mine it hits there first because it's the most visual. When people get incarcerated, when we look at um, blacks making up, or minorities making up 47% of the incarcerated, incarcerated people, yet 17% of the population. When we see those problems that are in our face and we can't ignore, or it's more difficult to ignore within the criminal justice system, um, that's great because we're actually looking at it. But we have to look a little bit deeper. The harsh reality is that those systemic problems, those implicit biases that we've talked about, those prejudices that have existed for a couple hundred years, do not exist in the vacuum or solely in the criminal justice system. They exist in the economic systems we have. They exist in the academic system. So a focus on criminal justice reform is healthy because we can make some sincere progress there. We can say we're going to drop the incarceration rate. We can say we're going to start spending money on rehabilitation, which will have enormous effects on, uh, on reincarceration. We can say all of that and maybe we can make some progress, but if we're ignoring the more harsh reality that exists in our society or American society as a whole, um, then almost the efforts in the criminal justice system may be not for naught, but it's going to be wasted effort because we have to look a little bit closer into our soul to really get to the point that we have had those problems that have existed for a couple of hundred years and they have to be addressed at a much more systemic level. Again, criminal justice shows us some opportunities there, um, and particularly when you have all of the events we're talking about, George Floyd being the most recent of dozens and dozens and dozens of them. But we can look at that and galvanize ourselves about it. Mm -hmm but we have to dig deeper and um, conversations like this will help. We'll be right back with more from our Real Talk, a candid conversation about criminal justice reform right after this. Stay this is the weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmith. Welcome back. On today's program, we wanted to highlight our latest edition of our Real Talk, a candid conversation series. Anchor Ginger Gadsden, along with our panel of experts, talked all things criminal justice reform, including sentencing disparities, wrongful convictions, and how we can make societal changes moving forward. Right, why are you calling me a felon? You know, and because th that right there already creates now mm -hmm. uh, a, a barrier and it creates problems for me to successfully reintegrate back into the community because now people are looking at me different. I'm feeling different about myself. 
when I'm just a human being like everybody else. And that's why we chose to use the word returning citizen, right? Because that, matter of fact, the Florida State uh, University have a criminology department, uh, doctoral department that's one of the best in the world. And they recently, uh, not too long ago, had um, uh, some, did some research called labeling. And it talks about that when we call someone ex-con, when we call them felon, right, that we actually increase the likelihood of them recidivating, mm. right? And uh, matter of fact, those of us know that if you call a child stupid growing up, he's gonna end up, or she's gonna end up thinking that they're what? That they're stupid. And so we need to put even more positive words in the air, and we've chose returning citizens, right? And, and when we use that, we at least instill some self-worth in the individual, mm -hmm. and we allow people to look at our humanity first, because that word felon is such a, 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 a harsh, a scarlet letter of shame, right, that helps perpetuate, right, the narrative that we're not good enough and that we're different, and, we, and it's okay to treat us different. It's okay to not allow us to have jobs. Right? But yes, we do power. face uh, those challenges, and people, folks need to understand. Yep. It is in society's best interest that when I am released, or someone like me is released uh, from, from prison, that we have every opportunity to successfully reintegrate. Now, I'm gonna tell you something else. A lot of times when we're talking about criminal justice reform, we talk about the guy or the male that's in prison. Here's the reality. Florida convicts uh, an average of a little over 170 something thousand individuals each year for a felony offense, right? Less than 25% of those individuals are even sentenced to prison. And so the reality is, is that when we're talking about the impact of our criminal justice system, it is the, the larger population that is being impacted are people who are, guess where? Right here in our homes, in our very homes, in our communities, in our congregations, right? And they're facing the same collateral consequences as an individual that's incarcerated. And we have to acknowledge that women, that the, the, the rate of women being incarcerated, right, is the fastest rate among any demographics and has grown over 800% over the last several years. Yeah. And so we have mothers who are being ripped away from their, from their children, and then when they're released, uh, they have all these barriers you can't get a job. They, they can't right. get an education. They can't live in safe, affordable housing. It just because creates municipalities a, so many have all these restrictions that will prevent someone with a felony conviction Absolutely. from being able to rent a home. Okay, so we want to give Mark Romero a, a chance to answer this as well. Yeah, if I might, because uh, an example of something that I don't think anyone with any sense could, could argue, about 20, 25 years ago, whenever it was, there was this program in the Department of Corrections called MDSO, Mentally Disordered Sex Offender Program. And what it was, was for the about two years before you were gonna get out, finishing your sentence, they would put you through this intensive program because you've been identified as a sex offender, you're about to get back out. It makes sense that they're gonna try and help you for those last two years. 22 whatever years ago, the Department of Corrections defunded that program. Think of the senseless nature of that, not just in and of itself, but of an organization that would say, we're not gonna spend the money on maybe those in most need um, before they go back out in society. So just that one little sliver. So the concern really is, you know, you look at it, ask yourself what a correction is, right? A course correction. You're going in a direction, you must be moved in a different direction. And I'm, I'm not to make fun of it, but we don't have a Department of Corrections we have a department of warehousing, because mm. all they do is warehouse people. Um, there's not good training programs there. There are not good rehab programs in there. We don't even try rehabilitation. As Ms. Ayala said, we've taken it out of the statute for some unknown reason, and yet we just warehouse people, put them back out on the street, call them felons, give them a conviction so that they can't get a job, can't get a, a, a lease. Um, and and it, what happens, of course, is that we are just 
causing the problems that we're now dealing with rather than preemptively dealing with it. Put the money in the beginning of the problem and you don't have to put any more money at the middle or the end of the problem. If you just want to look at this, don't even look at it as being a social event or, or societal gain. Look at it as pure economics. Look at the money that we spend on the criminal justice system mm -hmm. and put it anywhere near the education system. It would dwarf, it dwarfs the education budget. And it, it's senseless to keep adding Band-Aid after Band-Aid after Band-Aid on an event that is truly an infection, not just a cut. Yeah. Okay, I can't believe that we're almost out of time. So my final question for all of you, and if you could take 30 seconds or less to answer it, is what can you do today, each one of you individually, what can we do today to change or create change in the criminal justice system? Uh, Agnes, I'll start with you. Today, you can change the media and the entertainment things that you consume. You can start turning, looking in the mirror and, and, and checking your own heart and weeding out the implicit bias that is there. Stop believing it's not there, it is there. The real question is what implicit biases do you have? And that takes work, it takes uh, 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 digging into your past, it takes having tough conversations on social media in person. Uh, and, and go and find books by black authors Read my book. My, I invite you to <laughs> yeah. read The Record Keeper. Walk with my heroine. Investigate her pain. Connect with it and, and, and be changed by it. Go into your community. Reach out to those less fortunate than yourselves, disadvantaged, and help them. Whether it's mentoring program, a coaching program, the neighborhood captain who's helping out the kids whose mom and dad both have to work or maybe a single family home. You want to do something specific today? Figure out somebody who is in need or at risk and take them off of that path. Very simple, very straightforward, doesn't take a lot of money, doesn't take a legislative act. It takes you getting out there, maybe not watching TV quite as much, but giving some of your time to an individual to keep them out of the criminal justice system that I have to spend my time in defending those who've gotten to it. Get off the bench and get in the game. Mm. Vote. Register to vote. Don't be on the sideline anymore. And then if you need more, then I just recently just wrote a book, Let My People Vote, that I've just launched on my birthday yesterday. And folks can look it up and actually order a book to see how I overcame all these obstacles to lead Amendment 4. And in that book is a lot of lessons about how we come together as a community across all, all racial lines, across all political persuasions to move major policy issues. It can be done. We've proved it with Amendment 4, and we can make it happen again. The first thing to do is vote, as Desmond said, and I think we all agree, and, and be an informed voter. But in addition to that, Make a, a, a intentional effort to speak to somebody who is different than you, who differs. If you are committed to the issues of reform, talk to a law enforcement officer. Understand the, the issues that he or she is facing. If you are on the other side, then talk to someone who has been incarcerated. Understand his or her humanity. But anything that we do, the third thing, we've got to play it fair. This is not about safety anymore as it relates to safety in our comfort zone because the only way to true public safety is to do what is right and for us to have a relationship, for us to care about each other, and for us to share and, and connect in our own humanity. So do not play it safe. Play it fair. And a big shout out to anchor Ginger Gadsden, assignment manager Robert Brown, producer Tiffany Brown, and digital reporter Adrian Cutway for putting that special on. If you'd like to watch the entire hour-long episode, just head to clickorlando.com slash realtalk. I'm Justin Mormuth. Hope you have a great Sunday.